Welcome back to Too Much Future, the show where we play through the Fallout games and talk about them. I am Cameron, and with me as always is Michael. Hi. That's him. He's got a little, uh, he's got a big old noodle. Uh, uh-huh. Sitting on a little polystyrene body. Uh-huh. And it doodles all around. Uh-huh, yep. Mm. Look at me, my little polystyrene body is just, just really going at it. That's you. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, I told you this a minute ago and I forgot what it is. Uh, it's like episode eight of this one. <laughs> episode seven. It's episode seven of yeah. Fallout 4. Had to pull it up again. Episode seven of Fallout 4. Uh, Michael, what has happened so far in the Fallout 4 game? Okay. Uh, Fallout 4 starts before the war. You are a person who lives outside of Boston. You have a spouse and a baby. Uh, bombs fall. Baby get taken. Uh, because you're in the vault, uh, you're trying to find baby, a uh, little, little, little bitty baby son. Uh, and you discover that he has been carted around the wasteland by some guy named Conrad Kellogg. So you're tracking Kellogg, kill him, uh, find out all about Kellogg's past. But mainly the, the important thing is that he was working for this place called the Institute, uh, which is like a, a shadowy organization that's been terrorizing post-apocalyptic Boston by replacing people with uh, robots that look like them. Not a, not a great uh, thing to do, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and they also wanted your son. And uh, we wanted to figure out why and if they still have him. And so to, to do that, we've had to build a teleporter. And now we're in there. Yeah, now we're there. So wh while you were talking and saying that, you said bombs fall, baby get taken. Uh huh. Which has the cadence, the upper limit of rhythm uh -huh. of a Jonathan Colton song <laughs> from like 2009. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah, I ma I imagine uh, if we were around in in the mid 2000s, Jonathan Colton would have written a song about this. So I googled Jonathan Colton Fallout. Uh-huh. And unfortunately, Jonathan Colton did not write a song about Fallout, but he someone has created a mod on Nexus Mods called Radio Free Colton. Oh my goodness. And you can listen to 5.5 .5 hours of Jonathan <laughs> Colton songs while you're wandering the wasteland. Uh, okay. I think that might be better than half the music in Fallout 4. <laughs> Uh, definitely seems like it might have more variety. Uh, he, it, it certainly has some variety. You get that, uh, what, you know, that cake song? Uh-huh. That's him. Mm-hmm. What else do you do? Uh, the various songs that were used in, uh, WoW, uh, music videos. Right, right. I forgot about that. Th Let's there see was... here. He did, uh, oh, he did, uh, um, uh, oh, Still Alive is the, that's the, that's that cake song, huh? Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, I, you just got a lot of songs. Done. Anyway, if you weren't around, you know, it's something we never got around to. And uh, Homestuck made this world the ubiquity of Jonathan Colton songs <laughs> in like 2006 through, I don't know, 2013 or something. Yeah, something like that. <sighs> the cake was a lie. Uh, guess what? Guess what, what happened to me? What? What? Did, uh, you, did, we did a baby get stolen? Unfortunately, no. Okay. Yeah, I would be off on a quest right now if that were happening. Where right now I'm just in my house. <laughs> uh a few minutes ago, we were supposed to record this. And I said, Okay, let's do it. I'm getting ready. I'm outdoors. I'm in the woods. You know? I'm, mm -hmm. I got a shovel in my hands. I'm outdoors. Mm -hmm. Or no, I don't have a shovel in my hands. I'm mm -hmm. just outdoors. Mm -hmm. You're burying a courier. Nope, not burying anything. I'm digging up a courier. Oh, okay. I've got my platinum chip. It's hidden <laughs> in the woods and I got I can't remember exactly where I put it. So I'm just out in the woods and I'm, uh, you know, doing some stuff. I go, oh, it's almost time to go record Fallout. Mm -hmm. I turn around. Standing right behind me, stock still, completely silent, are two massive Rottweilers. Oh, boy. Uh-huh. And mm -hmm. then, cartoonishly, they begin going, and I have no idea how long they've been there. I haven't turned around in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. They could have been there just watching me this whole time. And they have a quizzical look about on their face. 
not a not you know they don't they don't have murder in their eyes. Mm-hmm. But I do immediately jump to, I'm gonna get Cujoed. Mm-hmm. There's nothing I yeah. can't climb anywhere. There's nothing for me to do. I have nothing on me. I had some pruning shears in my pocket, and I thought, uh oh, I you know I can't talk my way out of this. I can't I can't save scum. Mm-hmm. And so I slowly began. I had a shovel near me. And I slowly began. Hey, 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 dogs! You know, I'm I'm Ryan Reynolds in the shit out of this thing. Ryan Reynolds, circa you know whatever 2011, some rom ass com, right? Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And went, hey, hey guys, blah, 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 blah. because in uh, in movies, when you see a big scary dog that's growling at you, it like bites you on the butt and fluff comes out. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, or it gets that mailman. Because in real life, you you uh, bleed out in the yard because no one else is home. Mm-hmm. You know, while you're being mauled by two animals. And uh, so I get my shovel. I can, I can, you know, at least defend myself. And then these little assholes just start following me around. They won't leave me alone. There's like a slightly larger one, slightly smaller, and they're not growling at me anymore. We're just having a jovial time walking around the yard with these two massive dogs that are not mine. Mm-hmm. And that's when I texted you and I said something like, emergency, I'll, yeah. I'll contact you soon. Yeah, yeah, that is in fact what you said, yes. Yeah, and mm-hmm. uh, because I was like, because I have some, we have some outdoor cats. I'm not really a big fan of outdoor cats, just to be honest with you, but due to some contingencies when we moved in, you know, that you inherit some. Uh-huh, yes. And I was like, well, I can't go indoors because then it'll just be these outdoor cats with these outdoor dogs. And so I had to wander around my yard for 20 minutes calling everyone I knew even remotely in the area, to be like, do you know where these dogs belong? And they're just following me around. We're just having a good time. They like get in my garden beds and start fucking them up for some reason. Mm -hmm, You know, mm -hmm. they're rude. Sounds fun. It wasn't fun. It sucked. But the whole time, even occasionally I look around and say, hey, don't do that. And then I get a little, and I go, oh no, I'm going to get Cujo. I can't do it. So then I go up to, uh, I kind of walk up toward the, you know, the the main road. And a guy rolls, rolls by. And he gets out and he goes, and I was like, are these yours? And he's like, yeah, these are mine. And he's like, my neighbor, like, down the way, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, fascinating thing. A really nice guy. You know, and basically he told me, you know, it all comes out great. He said uh, this weekend a tree fell at his house and it knocked a big hole in his fence. Ah, uh, okay. Right. So his dogs go out. Well, that's fine. Um, and then they started rolling around on the ground and being like big, big boys, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but we had a long conversation. And he had a cigarette in his mouth the whole time mm-hmm. that never moved. Like Ooh. we had a full conversation and he is, he smoked a cigarette without removing it from his lips the whole time. It is an amazing Southern experience. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm late. Yes. Uh, and uh, also that is more eventful than anything that occurred in this playing <laughs> session of Fallout 4. Uh, I... Maybe for maybe for talk. I had some Uh-oh. I had Uh-oh. some experiences. What'd you do? Uh well, uh Nell, I mean Eleanor took some time and thought about what was going on. You know, uh we have this teleporter now, it's gonna take her into the institute. She's going to finally find Sean or come face to face with the people who took Sean at least. So she she kind of goes on a little trip and reviews everything thus far, right? She goes back to the house mm-hmm, back mm-hmm. in Sanctuary Hills and looks at the place where she and her husband used to live, where, where Sean's crib was. And she goes to Diamond City and she looks out over the stands and she goes to the Charles River and she looks up at the sky and she wonders, what is she doing in this world that's so different from the world that she came from? Well, she's allied herself with the railroad, and she wonders why that happened, because it happened so suddenly, as if it were some sort of contrivance for for some greater purpose. Mm -hmm. Uh, But she begins to to reflect on that, and she realizes that she's really into the railroad uh, because of all the people that she's met in the wasteland thus far. The railroad are the only faction that are, like, responding uh, to sort of the world as is. Right. They like like they are they, their concerns are evolving with the times, which is like we've got this synth issue. We need to do something about the synths. The Minutemen are just like, hey, wouldn't government be nice? I mean, maybe. OK, whatever. We had government in the old world. And look where it got us. Uh, 
Brotherhood of Steel is like we want to uh, stomp around in our big awful armor that no one ever should wear. So they're out. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's really People only like it. We've been getting some comments. Yeah, you know we 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 uh, you know as the French say say uh, shat all over it. You know the, the very <laughs> notion of wearing the power armor. We were both like, I'm not on board. <laughs> And we got some comments that were like, I am on board, and it's fun. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe I, I could be depriving myself of an experience. I'm not telling anyone that they are playing the game wrong, but I don't want to clonk around. I want to be my little guy. I want to huh. I want to play the game the way I want to play it, and I don't like the idea that I'm being, like, uh, you know, slowly but surely shunted into a tank in mm-hmm. order to deal with uh, some issues that may come my way. Yeah. Yeah, no. Eleanor's got to be zippy and, and, and quick. Uh, she's got to be nimble. Right. That's 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 what Eleanor is. Right. She's a lawyer, not a tank. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is why she's really felt really uh, drawn to the railroad, it turns out. And wouldn't you know it, the railroad are also the people who are kind of like most directly opposed to uh, the people who have taken Sean. So this really all works out. It's very, very, uh, uh, you know, cosmic for for Eleanor. So she goes back to the drive in. And uh, for some reason, Desdemona like reminds her that there's a uh, uh, a mole in the Institute that we're supposed to meet with. Uh, So we should try to play a double agent for as long as possible for the railroad. Okay, cool, whatever. Hop in the the teleporter, zaps me down into this strange, sterile space, Uh, walk out and poke around a little bit. It doesn't look too interesting. Uh, but then there's a voice that comes over the speaker, someone named father. And he's like, yes, no, come along. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, this is probably some sort of robot. I played a fallout before. I know how this works, right? When, when there's a voice talking to you, telling you to go places and it's a kindly old voice, it's usually a robot. Who's the president. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Eleanor gets in to a, a, an elevator and father like sends us off and we get our first glimpse of the Institute, which is like, uh, if you grew up in the 90s and saw how the 50s or maybe more like the 60s, I don't know, pictured the future in kind of its most sterile uh, uh, visions. This is what the Institute apparently looks like. Right. It's all like curves, smooth lines, like ovals. People are like wearing uh, these weird like smocks. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, father's all like, oh, you, you, people on the surface don't know what we really are, or what we really stand for. And he's not really telling me what these things are. He's just saying that people on the surface don't really understand what's going on down here, what the truth of the Institute is. OK, whatever. And uh, eventually I go down a little hallway and I step into a room and father's like, you know, OK, fine, whatever. Like, keep coming. Uh, and I go into the room and there's a little boy in like a, a, a cell. And mm-hmm. Ellen, right. And Eleanor realizes that's Sean. That's little Sean that we saw back when we were uh, bebopping around in Kellogg's mm-hmm. memories. I think he's also labeled Sean. He is also labeled Sean. <laughs> Just in case you were confused. Like, you know what I mean? Like, maybe you went off and did like 400 quests in between now and then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's Sean. And so there's Sean. And uh, Eleanor's trying to talk to him. And Sean, Sean doesn't recognize her. It's the most horrible thing. That he's like, who are you? Uh, uh, like, what do you want? And Eleanor's just like, Sean, it's mommy. Like, you know, uh, 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 don't you remember me? Like, how do I get you out of here? Can you open the door? Because I can't open the door. I tried opening the door even before I, I, I talked to him. Uh, and Sean is just getting like more and more panicked. And he's shouting uh, and he's screaming for fathers like she wants to take me. Father, father. Uh, mm-hmm. And then suddenly this door opens and this man walks in. And obviously, if his name is Father, like he's a really important guy here, really important guy in the Institute talking over the intercom like, you know, a robot president would. So mm-hmm. he's really, when you think about it, the person who is responsible for all of this. And Eleanor snaps. Oh, oh no. She whips out. You didn't even out. talk to him? You didn't go She whips father? out. She she sees red. There's something else happening, right? Like the, the, the chaos that builds within her. And she whips out the fat man. And she uh, targets his head in vats. And she explodes him in the head with a critical strike from a mini nuke. And father's body goes flying backward. He dies instantly. Uh, huh. And uh, and then Sean just like uh, stops and like turns around and like is staring into the corner, like in the Blair Witch and won't talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
and well you've been bad yeah yeah you gotta do it you gotta deal with the one not in the corner first i mean we all know blair witch rules right <laughs> this, is, this, is blair, this is a classic blair witching yeah you know? yeah i mean it is a very classic blair witching because uh, uh then eleanor continues on and she investigates the room beyond uh, uh this dead asshole um, wait wait hold on hold on wait wait wait. so you're telling me he's dead well okay so you need you need to Listen to the whole story here. Oh, okay. So Eleanor investigates. Oh, I, I'm so I am so sorry for clarifying a piece of information <laughs> that I, just happened in the story. Yes, but, yes, he's dead. But, but but by all means, continue. Yes. <laughs> so he's dead, uh, and the room beyond him has like nothing in it. Uh, there's like an upstairs. Uh, there's like a woman who suddenly appears, and her name is just Synth, and she's mm-hmm. like, thanks to your, thanks to your son, like we get to exist. And I'm like, what, what? What does that mean? Uh, and then I like pop open my pit boy because uh, it's like super eerie. There's like nothing to do. I think I've like broken the game. Uh, pop uh-huh. open the pit boy. And in the thing, uh, in like my little like quest log, it's like uh, father revealed himself and he is now uh, that he is actually Sean who has grown up and he is the head of the Institute. <laughs> uh-huh. And I'm like, and, and like, you know, I chose not to join him. So... <laughs> Um, this uh, also oh, incidentally, so the, so the game is just like you choosing to blow that guy up. The game just goes, all right, let's just skip a bunch of flags, <laughs> like quest flags. We'll just uh, pretend you made a decision, which I guess you did. Yeah. Uh, and so like, uh, I, I, I think that I'm like stuck for real, but then it turns out I just have to like retrace my steps. But when I do that, I'm being attacked by synths and all this stuff. And I also realized that, uh, by doing what I have done, I've actually failed the railroad quest line. Uh, and so wouldn't you know it, this all turns out to be a doomed timeline. Uh, oh, Eleanor yeah. blinks at the moment that father comes through the door. Uh, and then we have this long conversation where he reveals that he is Sean and he is the head of the Institute now. And he would like, uh, uh, Eleanor slash the player character to join him and try as I might. I can't figure out what the upshot of that is. I think it's a little confused. Yeah, you know, similar deal. Not not the Doom timeline, but, you know, Tonk does several of these things. During this conversation with uh, with Father, a.k.a. Sean. Now, uh, quick question, I guess. Did you already know this reveal? Uh, no, I did not. I mean, uh, like, I... Uh, suspected that there was going to be something done with like the time gaps uh mm-hmm. and i like i knew that i was going to try to kill whoever like was the head of this faction if i could right and it turns out i did and <laughs> got a uh, confirmation of timeline skipping in probably the most confusing way possible or not really timeline skipping but you know like uh, mm-hmm. i i felt that there was there was something about the fact that they made sure to show Sean as a kid that i was like there's something right. about this that like feels like a fake out right and we know that some amount of time passed cuz he's like a like a 8 year old or something now right you know? Uh, yeah, I don't, don't what, how do you feel about it? You, you think it works? Cuz this is like a big deal within this game, right? Mm-hmm. Like the 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 reveal that there's a time jump and you know it's kind of Westworldy right you mm-hmm. know Westworld season one plays with this too I don't know that comes out after this right is that true uh, no this comes out before that no it does 2016 yeah. so mm-hmm. yeah this is after Fallout Four so that's notable in and of itself I guess but yeah uh, but uh, yeah I don't know D- does it work for you what do you think um I actually think that this is a good twist I think it would be better if it were better executed. That's that's kind of how I feel. like it's like a really neat uh, turn in the narrative, but also like I feel like it's a little bit flubbed. I feel like I don't have the best sense of the Institute and sort of like I actually I guess what this means. Uh, the Sean reveal is cool. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that I have to then like learn about the Institute and the Institute is kind of like weirdly vague and and just uh Mm -hmm. i just feel like the institute itself is not particularly well drawn and so there's this like weird like you know one one step forward two steps back that i experience with this whole like little mission here yeah that's like that is the weird thing about it is it is like like holy shit did you know and you're and if you played that if there were like drama involved with that or if there were like moments to be other than one dialogue option, I think. I think there was literally one dialogue where you could be like, holy shit, time hijinks, you know? Yeah. It doesn't sit with it. You know, it's just like, hey, we skipped some time. Anyway, shut the fuck up. We're, we're talking about the instant. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. we, we move so quickly beyond it. And I really do think if the game had, 
I, like I don't mean this in in a in in a mean way at all, but I think this is a true problem with Fallout Four specifically. If the game had any sense of pacing or drama, you could do a lot with a little here. Yeah, but but the game truly like it has obliterated any notion of like pacing. Right? It's there. There's no sitting with an idea for any amount of time. It's just like information to to wash over you. And so, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I think w- one step forward, two steps back is right because you immediately are are like, be, like your own son is making charisma checks against you to right. get you to to join his like robot army of of like nerds, right? Um, and you know, as you asked me, you asked me this off mic, what the fuck is the institute doing? <laughs> yeah. And I didn't have an answer for you. <laughs> I, I mean, I can tell you stuff they do, uh-huh. but like, what's the end game? <laughs> Robot people. And to be fair, there's a little, that maybe to give the game some credit about drama, there is a lot of stuff about Phase Three that we learn here. What's Phase Three? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what that is, but it's something. Yeah. Um. But uh. But uh. Just uh. Before before we move forward, the thing to say about this too is that Tonk had a great time because there's something really odd here that happens with the way that the dialogue is managed between you and Sean. Uh. And the because he like busts through a door to uh-huh. be like, "Hey, I'm Sean. I'm your child." Uh huh. But there's something about that location, and I've now gotten pretty good at like creating the weird Tonk. Uh, like dialogue glitches and stuff. I figured out like how to move my mouse and shit to like make it kind of do it more. Uh-huh. And so I'm I'm listening to the conversation. But I've also played the game before, and I know that there's not a huge amount of information to be gained here. And so I really spent a lot of time during this playing with that. <laughs> I eventually got it to a point where the camera cut backwards, and we both had our backs to one another. <laughs> and then Sean uh, turned around, but Tonk did not. Like so, I've got some really good footage here of just like people. <laughs> looking left and right and up and down and turning around and like Sean's like his face is up against the glass and he has to turn around because we've like teleported through one another. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's good stuff because it like makes assumptions when the camera moves, it makes assumptions about where people are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that moves them and makes them turn around in real time. So it's it's quite fun. (laughs) I've also figured out that like in dialogue, if I right when it transitions, if I whip my mouse to the left or the right really quickly, it'll like make Tonk spin all the way around. So (laughs) there's some good stuff uh, that happens here. But but yeah, we learn about the Institute. That's kind of like the goal here, right? Yeah, yeah. Father explains that uh, the Institute was started by the faculty of the Institute, like pre-war, they took refuge in uh, the basement uh, below the the pre-war Institute and just continued tunneling down over the past two centuries and uh, Mm -hmm. building more and more elaborate habitats and preserving uh, I I guess in a way that we're to assume is basically, you know, unbroken, like technological uh, progress pre-war because we've got like all these cool, like mass effect style elevators and things like that. Now, even mass effect style smocks really. Uh, And he tells you to go like wander around and introduce yourself and like find out more about the Institute. So there are like all these divisions, right? There's like a division that uh, builds their robots. There's a division that, uh, is like bioscience, uh, and you can just like learn about the various things that people at the Institute are doing. But again, it, it's very odd because it's also, also sparse, uh, mm-hmm. right there, there, I, during this chunk in particular, I was, uh, really feeling, um, like the resonance here with something like fallout one mm-hmm, where it mm-hmm. almost feels like oh, an area gets created. There are NPCs there and they are all getting like two to three lines of kind of like stuff to do, but like the social world is not really existing around them, right? They have their little schedules and stuff, uh, and their places to stand, but everything, uh, there's a way in which like I, when I'm playing this game now, I'm picturing it from like an, uh, uh, isometric perspective and it's, uh, uh, weirdly appropriate, right? It feels like fallout one in the way that it's written and how sparse it can be, uh, and yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of feeling like really interesting story stuff here. What did Tonk do? Did like Tonk do any of this talking? Yeah, Tonk like, walked around and talked because the quest that he gives you is just like, hey, go talk to everyone and you'll find out how good the Institute can be. Yeah. 
Uh, and so, yeah, Tonk went and talked to everybody. Um, uh, mostly because you got to do that to teleport out. Uh, yeah, that's right. You talked to Madison Lee, who was from Fallout 3. That's all I wondered. So is this the same character? Yeah, I think it's supposed to be because she's also you meet her in Rivet City, which is where you found out about the Institute in Fallout 3. Again, like right, I was expecting right. maybe something a little more solid to like call back to that connection. And no, not really. Yeah, I yeah, I was I was interested. Yeah, it is the same character because I, I was like, I think there haven't we already seen a Madison Lee? And I was like, no, nah, maybe it's just a, a character with the same like first or last name. And I just forgot. Mm-hmm. So I didn't look it up. But yeah, so it seems like ended up rolling up there. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's some some interesting maneuvers here. Really, the most interesting thing that I did in the Institute. Uh, well, uh, sorry, let me let me take one step back to, to, to refer to a thing that you said. I, I agree. I think this is a lot like Fallout 1 and 2 specifically in those places where you can just wander around in some vaults and talk to people. And there's mm-hmm. like very little to actually learn, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of space to do it in. I, I think that this is somehow, I think maybe even on accident. I don't know how much this is on purpose, but it has that effect of like, yeah. yep, this is the place. They they do the stuff here. That's cool. That's neat. What What's here? Nothing. Okay, mm-hmm. cool, 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 cool. Uh, very good. But yeah, so you talked to all these different people. Madison Lee is working on the synths, right? Uh, yes, I believe so. Uh, which doesn't seem like her. Yeah, like or is it advanced wise. systems or something? I she was standing right beside a synth that was like being repaired when I. Oh, that's right. And if you find her, I was like, I think I found her uh, terminal or something, and she has some mm-hmm. report where. She's oh, maybe it's a hollow tape she has where she's um talking about father requesting the 10 year old Sean synth be built. Uh, mm. And she doesn't like that. Like she thinks that that is like creepy and irritating. Totally cool to make a uh, bunch of slave robots that have human thoughts and emotions and feelings. Totally cool. But when when they're 10, uh huh, that's where we draw the line. <laughs> Uh, but that doesn't feel like her. I don't know. We'll learn probably more about her later, I assume. Yeah. Because uh, that does that feel like that character to you, the person who was like critical to making sure that everyone had clean water? Yeah. Like, making a bunch of synthetic slaves, essentially. Um, I just. Mm, mm, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's odd. Uh, it is. Oh, I was going to say the mm-hmm, other yeah. thing that. Um, oh, so like one thing that you discover is that like the, the they've built like a uh, synth um, gorillas. Yes, you know, they people referred to the gorillas. I never saw them. Oh, really? They're I like, felt like I walked around a lot, but maybe not. Oh, they're like in a little um, uh, containment thing. I wonder if like hmm. they didn't spawn for you or something. No, I did. I, I got to that room by walking through the FEV stuff. Um, and so maybe I just walked past where they were. Yeah. Like I took oh. I took kind of a, you know, shortcut away from something else. So. Hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, like so, th- they're just these like synth gorillas, and it's a another example. Like you can talk to the people who are working on this, and they don't really give a reason for like why they've made synth gorillas. Uh, I'm very so terribly sorry for uh the specific reference, but in a lot of ways, I was thinking about how uh talking to the institute people feels a lot like talking to the underpants gnomes from South Park. <laughs> uh, yeah uh you know uh that's true i forgive you for the reference although yeah. the, the viewer listener might not yeah it's because it, it's just so much like so hey what are you doing and it's like oh we're doing uh like we're we're making uh perfect replicas of human beings that for some reason need uh human genetic material this is by the way why they took sean uh they needed like pre-war genetic code so there's something this is like invoking the enclave especially from fallout 2 um but for some reason in order to build like these perfect humanoid robots they needed actual human dna uh and at that point um the it's like you you talk to these people they tell you about their projects but also they don't really tell you what the applications of these projects are so like I guess real gorillas are extinct, so we're going to make robot ones. And then what are those going to do? I don't know. Uh, why are we making these, uh, like, the things that, like, Father says are like, oh, you know, it's like the best hope for humanity or whatever. So it's just like, step one, like, create robots that replace real things. Step two, step three, best future for humanity. <sighs> 
I, w- I wish I thought you were wrong. You know what I mean? <laughs> I wish I could like sum up a good defense of why that's not the case, but that kind of yeah. is it. It's like they worked backwards from the faction first, yeah. right? Like we need science good faction. Mm-hmm. And you go, all right, what do they do? And they go, ah, they're the science good faction. They make slaves. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I was going <laughs> to say like the, the, like, the I don't I don't know, buddy. Yeah, like the, the I think the coolest way this could have gone. I think this is the other thing about this game, also, right? And how kind of like barren sparse it can be is that it's a, a very hooky for like imagining like a slightly more detailed version that would come later. Because mm-hmm. like I think the interesting way that you could play the institute here is something like you know the enclave with a smile, where they like are are sort of. Uh, basically working themselves around to the exact same uh, kind of principles, but uh, out of a, a, a sort of a self-involved, uh, uh, like, we're actually doing this for the good of everyone kind of way. Well, that's kind of, I, I, I'll be honest, I think they are th- just the Enclave. That That's kind of where I get to at the end of this, is it's just the science division of the Enclave. They just don't have Richard Nixon running around, right? Like... Uh, because they, they do all the same stuff. Their whole deal is that they're not the ones who are irradiated, or at least they're minorly irradiated. Um, they send monstrous, you know, murderers out to do their bidding everywhere. And then they, they take and take from the people who actually are having to like grind it out on the surface. And then they want to replace them all. Yeah, I found like a terminal where they like go through this series of reports where they uh, locate a guy on the surface who's like a farmer, like working a little, you know, like homestead up in the north of the map or something. Uh, And they're just like, oh, this would be a good recon place. And so they like kidnap that guy and torture him. uh, And then I guess implicitly kill him and then send up a a synth like replica of him to like be their eyes on the ground over there. And it's just it's very coldly and like, you know, uh, uh, cleanly done. Uh, in a way that is very at odds with how they are presenting themselves to you, but also the game itself is requiring me to do so much of the um, work there to generate that friction. Right. And and part of the thing, too, like, did you do the FEV laboratory? Did you do that little thing? No, I couldn't. I couldn't find it. And I know I'm supposed to go there because I need to help uh, Virgil, but um, right. I decided yeah, not to do it yet. Yeah, that's why I sought it out. Is I was like, I'm coming here probably one time and mm-hmm. I'm going to complete this quest while I'm here. So uh, I, yeah, I, I go in there and get it, and I'm, it's, you know, an FEV lab. It's got an Assaultron in there. Um, you, you know, you got to fight all these things. They, they like, obliterate you if they charge up their laser, mm-hmm. and so you have to, to you know, uh, we're talking about underpants gnomes. Let's just get it all out there. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there's uh, an epic bacon-looking, um, you know, uh, <laughs> what, what's that thing called? Super Mutant in there. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I've got stairs in my house. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you go, but, but you, thankfully you can use the elevator. Um, I don't know. You got a couple more here. Uh, some lolcat shit. Let's throw that in. (laughs) You got any other ancient memes? The the Institute has been preserving, uh, memes for the past two Mm -hmm. centuries. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Uh, but yeah, so you can find the thing and it's, it's basically, it's a, it tells a pretty cool story. By the way, I just, uh, pulled it up. There is more to learn about Lee, and oh, okay. we'll find out more about why she is there. Okay, I, don't, I you know, so so um, sit tight on that. There there is actually a reason why she's there, but uh, but yeah, you find out. So basically, what happened is like they were doing experiments. They had a supply of FEV, presumably from the institute, um, and they were doing experiments on uh, kind of improving humanity mm. um, and making people more appropriate for the wasteland it seems because you can listen to a couple um tapes about it Mm -hmm. like audio logs about it and uh virgil was like this sucks it isn't working uh we're doing horrifying experiments we've been doing it for 10 years um i'm gonna tank this operation Mm -hmm. and so he tanks it by like experimenting on himself and everyone's like that's it's a bridge too far and so they shut down the FEV program, and that's when the synth program starts. Hmm, interesting. Right, so it gives you a little bit of background to that whole decision-making thing, too. Um, and so, yeah, uh, so I got the, you know, the, what do you call it for him, all that stuff, the his experimental blah, blah. No oh. juice. Well, I knew yeah. I was I didn't do that because I knew I was going to have to go back because I did have to do the double agent thing. Uh, Desdemona right. had given me right. um, a thing to upload uh, to an institute terminal in order to contact Patriot, who is the uh, railroad's mole. 
Mm -hmm. um so i do you use the you use the railroad as your in yes Mm -hmm. right and so i use the minutemen so i have the same quest but from sturgis and which makes no sense because sturgis (laughs) just when you give it to him he goes all right, I'll see what I can do with this. I don't know. I just I just thought it'd be a good idea to get get that information <laughs> while you were in there. And it, like, you have such a clear reason for that, you uh-huh. know, Eleanor does, but there's no fucking it's, Sturgis is just some fucking guy. You right. know what I mean? Like uh, but anyway, sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but I so I did the same quest just for someone else. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you met with uh Liam. Uh, who's Liam? Oh, okay. Uh, I think this goes a little bit differently for me then. Um, no, yeah, no. I just got the information and took it to him. No additional steps required. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, I uh, scan their network um, and I send out a signal that Patriot intercepts and Patriot responds to me urgent and tells me to go uh, uh, meet in a supply closet. So I run off that that direction, find him. It's this guy named Liam Benet. He is a scientist for the Institute. His uh, father is actually the head of the robotics division. Uh, and he has basically like, uh, you can have a brief conversation with him uh, where he explains that, you know, he was just like a regular Institute scientist, uh, but he kind of got into, uh, he started uh, sending out synths, like helping them escape. Cause apparently like since, just on their own, uh, slowly develop the ability or will to escape or to want to escape. Mm -hmm. Because this is the other thing that's sort of confusing here is that there are like synths all over the Institute. uh, And they're like very clearly like robots. And then there are some that aren't clearly robots. But uh, uh, due to the nature of NPCs, I guess it's very hard to figure out like they're they're not really distinguished, right? Apart from visuals and uh, uh, how their voices are rendered. Right. So anyway, um, he started uh, helping the sense kind of as like a, a way to like, can he do it right? Could he like come up with a way to uh, uh, like break sense out? Um, and I guess he did. Uh, and now that you're here, like he didn't even know that there was anyone on the surface who would help. Right. The 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 railroad kind of forming as it did is as much of a surprise to him uh, as anyone else. Uh, and so he's like really excited to finally be in contact with them. And he thinks like, Oh, like why, why send out one at a time, which is what he's been doing. Uh, what if I could like get a whole bunch of synths out at one time? Um, and so he takes me to meet this other synth who is like working, uh, somewhere else in the Institute. He's like sweeping or something and he has a name, but it's, uh, the synths when they get names have like letter number names. What is this? I wrote it down. It's Z one 14. Greg um, 29. And so Z114 is this synth who uh, has been helping like uh, uh, Liam figure out which synths want to escape and then, uh, you know, report like basically uh, uh, he is the link between Liam and uh, the larger synth dissident community, I guess. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that there are like 13 other synths uh, that re- that want to get out. And uh, basically, if uh, we play our cards right, we can just like get them all out at once. And what Liam needs is to get into like the the core of the security of the Institute's computer system, uh, which is built on the same software that was running uh back before the bombs fell. But in order to do that, I need to get like an old, old, like pre-war access code for him. So I have to go back to the surface and figure out uh, where to get one of these things uh, and then head back and I guess help these synths escape. How are the synths escaping? I I don't know. Everyone teleports in and out. I, I assume, yeah, the synths are being teleported out and he's got some sort of... <sighs> Cloak? <laughs> Some sort of hat? <laughs> <laughs> and garment? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, it's always... I'm sure there's some tunnels or some shit. Also, by the way, we t- we glossed over it earlier, but the story of the Institute is that people, when the bombs fell, some MIT nerds mm-hmm. went into the basement and then just dug a massive complex. Yes, it's silly. It's it's like uh just those uh, eggheads can't dig a <laughs> they can't dig a hole. What are you talking about? I mean, so like yes, right. Like uh, as someone who has like been on this campus, if I like looking around, I'm not just like, oh yeah, if we were all trapped down in the labs, 
uh, and like the bombs fell. I don't think I would put it to us to be able to create this like Logan's run type world we got going down here. <laughs> like, right. where is the material coming from? Like, how on <sighs> earth? <laughs> right. I and, and they've got so much space. They're shutting some space out. Yeah, They're locking doors and shit. You, you know, I don't look. I don't need this to be a like a like a wholly realistic second world or anything. I'm not asking for that. But there are some like basic things where you go, okay, I guess. I don't know. But also, why do I accept like all the other shit in this game? And I like have any question about this. So mm-hmm. you know, maybe that's on me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Like, nah, I I think it's fair because I could see it if like maybe there was originally a vault underneath like the institute. That, right. I mean, that's that, how that's how Fallout 2 would have explained this. Right. There was a right. vault and then like they built downward from the vault. And maybe that is the implication, but I haven't seen that said, you know, that because that's the weird thing about it. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I don't know what to do about it. Right. Uh, but yeah, uh, Tong just talked to all these people and then left. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did that. And then I left. I went back to the surface and then uh, I did some side quests before I went back and uh, talked to people at the railroad headquarters. Is there anything, because we haven't met a major faction. I mean, we've met them, but we haven't done anything for the Brotherhood yet. That's the mm-hmm. other kind of major faction. And lo and behold, perhaps not shocking, I think there are four factions. I think it's the Institute, the uh, the Railroad, the Minutemen, and then the Brotherhood. Mm-hmm. And you cut, for your ending, I believe you choose one of those. It's been a minute, but I think that there's like a point of no return and you pick one that you want to go with. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we haven't really engaged with one, so you can't really make a decision yet. But... Is there anything that is appealing to you about the Institute? And I mean that like seriously and authentically, like as, as a human being, is there anything in the Institute that makes you go, oh, maybe I want to join up with them. Maybe they're the good, maybe they're the good ones Uh, to go with. I'm going to say, uh, absolutely not. And also like the Institute feels like, um, you choose this faction because you want the coolest room to hang out in, in the post game. Uh, yeah, that could be true. Right. Like that's that what that's what feels like uh, the the motivation for choosing the Institute at this point for me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I get it. Sometimes you don't have that good room. Yeah. Hmm. OK. Uh, what would you do up on the surface? Because that's all we did with the Institute in this episode. Mm-hmm. But we did decide to do some faction quests and you and I have made a decision. Mm hmm. I think we're both going to do the Brotherhood quests up to a certain point, mm-hmm. you know, because we're, because we're interested in the Brotherhood. But I don't think that we are both equally interested in the Minutemen, which you have said are that you don't care about mm-hmm. at all. Uh, you're not even a general. <laughs> you're just some guy. Yeah. Uh, or some lady, in fact. The uh, so I'm doing those quests, you know, kind of in, in my free time. And you are doing the railroad. What what'd you get up to? Uh, so I had a, actually a couple of outstanding railroad quests already at this point, because just like I I'd used them as my end for the Institute. And so I'd picked up like some side quests from them. Uh, one was from Tinker Tom, where he has like some weather uh, machines, like some weather vanes that he has created and he wants to use to. <laughs> hold, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Weather machine is like yeah. harp or or, or <laughs> like a thing that tells you what the weather is. I mean, I guess it's a thing that tells you what the weather is. I don't exactly understand why he needs to know this, but he talks about like atmospheric mm-hmm. pressures and stuff. I guess maybe okay. those radiation storms that come in from the glowing maybe. sea. That probably... I just thought maybe Tinker Tom had more going on than yeah. he assumed. <laughs> if, he, if he was Illuminati like controlling the weather. <laughs> I think I would have I would have put Tinker Tom right at the top of my list of, of people to check out. But uh, anyway, yeah, no, he he's just like, I built this little like uh, uh, like weather meter, like go put it on a high point in the city. And it turns out to be this um, uh, like old clothing store on the Charles River. And so I go over there and it's filled with raiders and I kill them and I go to the roof and I put it there. And, and that's that. Uh, then there was a. um uh there were two quests that i had to check out um like safe houses this is this is the thing about uh the railroad quest lines uh is that they are like all about going to where their safe houses are checking them out uh finding out if people are still there or not there and uh so on and so forth so i have two of them one is uh to check out uh, a dead uh, 
how the quests often work is like I have to go out to a place like on the map uh, that's called a dead drop where like some railroad agent has dropped uh, uh, a prompt for like the next leg of the quest. Uh, and these are radiant. And so they're like, you know, semi randomized or whatever. Uh, one of them is I don't I'm double checking now on the wiki. One of them, I think, is not radiant. Uh, I think it's regular. It's called Butcher's Bill. Um, but it's kind of impressive that you you might not know. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I and I don't know if that means that the ceiling is low enough that it doesn't matter <laughs> or that the floor is high enough. You know what I mean? Right. Like are are the radiant quests good enough that they pass muster or is every quest just kind of so flat that they all kind of feel like they work? Mm-hmm. Eh, I don't know. Right. I don't know if I necessarily I don't know if this is universally positive, but the fact that you might not immediately know if it's authored content or radiant AI doing stuff, I think that's at least notable. Yeah. Well, uh, and it's because the, 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 the trick I think is they figured out how to like structure these things. So I just double checked. There is one that is radiant and one that is not, um, the one, uh, that is not is called butcher's bill. And there's a doctor in the uh, railroad HQ named Carrington. Who's like, uh, I want you to go check. He was the one who gave me the Bunker Hill quest that I described in the last video. And he's like, now I want you to go check out uh, this other safe house of ours that I think might have been attacked. It's the Augusta safe house. Uh, uh, The location is in a dead drop. Go get it. I go get it. It turns out it is uh, the uh, the safe house is located in an old hospital. Um, I go to the old hospital. Guess what? Uh, It's not a safe house anymore. It is filled with raiders. Uh, There are a couple of dead synths around. I eventually find a hollow tape uh, that suggests uh, that's like from the uh, uh, railroad people that were hiding out here. And they're like, oh, no, we're not going to last much longer. And then that's it. That's kind of the end. So I go through this whole (laughs) thing, uh, kill all these raiders. And I get to this like final room and this is another place where this feels so much like a Fallout 1 type thing because there's no like story here other than this, right? Like what I have told you is basically all there is. There's not like little characters or like a little backstory. It's just like I went to a place, uh, found a thing that was literally just someone writing like they're pounding at the door. I can hear them now. Oh, no. Uh, And then I kill a bunch of goblins. And then I get to this last room that's like a really like multi-storied room uh, shooting all these raiders. One of them has a rocket launcher that kills me a couple times, but I managed to get through it. And then I get down to the bottom expecting there's going to be some sort of payoff here. Do you want to know what's at the bottom, Cameron? What, what kind of building is this again? It, it used to be a hospital. And there's like now there's like a giant like raider. So this is the other thing is that this was a this was a railroad safe house at one point, And now it's gone like full Mad Max like lair with like a giant multi-story like pit down into the basement. But anyway, yeah. So what do you think I find at the very bottom of this pit? What do I think oh, at the bottom of the pit? It's a raider hellscape. Deathclaw. Yes. Right. <laughs> There's just a friggin death claw there. Uh, Great. Like, no, no, like little story rewards. Like, yeah, no, you got to the end of the dungeon. Uh, here's the boss. Uh, and so and, and now I can't get out. I can't figure out how to get out of the friggin pit. So I'm like running around in circles uh, being chased by this death claw. And now I actually have to pull out the, the fat man again. And I hit it with two nukes and kill it. And that actually gets me out. But anyway, then I go back to Railroad HQ and I'm like, hey, guess what? Everyone there was dead. And he was like, oh, all right. Well, that's too bad. And then the other one I got, uh, there's a there's another safe house, the Randolph safe house that went quiet Mm -hmm. for a while. And now it started communicating again. uh, And Desdemona is uh, suspicious, right? She's like, well, we can like we should work with them, but they were gone. They were quiet for a while. This may be some sort of institute trap. So like. Uh, play along with it and figure out what they want. Um, the first dead drop I find tells me that uh, it, it's from a guy named Mr. Timms, who I guess was like the the head agent at the safe house. He's like, we're trying to uh, get in contact with some people at another safe house. Can you go check on it for us? Uh, and this turns out to be that's uh, marked on my map. It's at University Point, um, which is in the real world where uh, UMass, Boston, is, along with the JFK uh, library. So this is just north of Quincy. 
Um, and it happens that I've like gone down, like I've poked around this into the map and I've uh, gotten to Ponzit Park. So I fast travel down there and then I'm walking up to uh, the settlement at University Point. And while I'm doing that, I pass a house that's been bombed out. Uh, and next to it is a fridge and I hear a muffled voice of what sounds like a little boy saying like, hey, hey, are you are you over there? Let me out. Uh, wouldn't you know it, Cameron? There's a little boy in that fridge. He's trapped in there. He he says that he got in there uh, to hide from the bombs when they fell. Uh, and he's been stuck ever since because there's uh, no handle on the inside. And I'm like, wait a minute. The bombs fell like 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, were there perhaps uh, big sucker creatures that were uh, flying toward it? Some sort of big mosquitoes? And is he afraid of a big clown? No, no, actually. With, uh, silver balloons yeah. and silver eyes yeah, and whatnot? Yeah, no, uh, opportunity for a reference, missed. That's how you know huh. Bethesda Fallout is a different beast. Yep. Uh, you beefed it. You beefed it. So I pop open the fridge, and there's, wouldn't you know it, there's a little ghoul boy in there, and his name's Billy. Uh, and well, he's, that's, that's cool. <laughs> and he's like, I, I mean, it's <laughs> terrible. He's been in there, though, yeah. but conceptually cool. He's like, I don't know how long I've been in there. It was dark. Uh, and he wants to go home to his parents. And I have to be like, I'm sorry, kid, oh, but your man. parents are probably dead. Is he the first <laughs> little ghoul boy? Yeah, he's he's the first child ghoul. I think we well, no, I mean, maybe I think there was maybe some child ghouls in three. Um, Let me Google that. that not not going to be any problem. Just Googling child ghoul, right? Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, but you know, this, this little boy and, uh, I, I have this moment of, of beauty here that I can imagine that the game immediately undercuts, which is like, oh my God, I hope he's a companion. Like this would be so good for Eleanor's story right. is like, I found the false robot, Sean, and then like my traitorous, a uh, real now old man, Sean. <laughs> And now I'm going to, like, uh, uh, supplement that loss, right? I'm going to have, like, my surrogate little ghoul son who follows me around the wasteland. Because you can tell him to do that. You can make that offer to him. Uh, but he doesn't really want to do it. He wants to go find his parents. And so even though I'm supposed to be doing this other quest, I'm like, okay, I'll take you back to your parents. Huge error. Yeah. Uh, let me, I, I did a little Google here. Uh -huh. First results, a Reddit thread. Okay. From nine years ago. Has there ever been a ghoul child? Oh, okay. That's that's the text. Uh-huh. Here or that's the title. Here's the text. We've all seen ghouls, but I don't think I've ever seen a ghoul kid. Let's discuss it, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> that's the full text. All right. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so uh I am like, okay, whatever. I'll I'll take you to your family, Billy. And he marks on my map where his family lives. Uh uh, hold on, I gotta interrupt you really okay. quick to tell you this. There's another, this is from four years ago. Okay. Title, Why I Think the Controversial Fridge Kid Ghoul is Consistent with the Lore. Oh. Uh. The, the longest thread in Fallout <laughs> Reddit history. Uh, no, there it does have 260 upvotes and 63 comments. People do, in fact. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone says, just ignoring the fact that he's become a ghoul, let's acknowledge the fact that this kid has spent two centuries, 73,000 continuous days inside of a fridge. Just the idea that he hasn't become insane from spending a time equal to today's date back to the Napoleonic Wars is mind boggling. <laughs> that is notable. That's true. Yeah. And I was the first person to like help him out. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and then immediately as I like he marks it on my map, it's on the other side of Quincy to the south. So I'm like, OK, uh, I'll, I'll I just turn around and I walk in the up opposite direction. And as I do that, this man who looks like a biker comes walking up to me just like out of nowhere. And he's like, hey, nice kid. You want to sell him? What? Yeah. Just like immediately this man appears on the road and like offers to buy this like 12 year old ghoul boy from me. And I'm like, that's interesting. Yeah, but we haven't really had that. You know, it is. I have thought in Fallout 4, we've really started uh, sanding the, you know, the burrs off of this thing. Uh huh. But yep. <laughs> Selling a kid. Let's get that right back in there. Jesus. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you know, Eleanor is already on the side of the railroad and everything has always been anti-slavery. So she's like, no, I'm not going to sell you that kid. And he's like, all right, cool. Keep me in mind. And he keeps walking. So I pull out my gun and I blow his head off. And then I keep walking. Uh, I eventually get to Quincy and I like am really excited to actually get here because uh, uh, Quincy was actually a the first place I lived when I moved to Massachusetts. I don't live there now, but, uh, you know, this is a 
uh, a real like, oh, I've, I've been in this place. I know this kind of like little downtown area. Like, let's check out and see what mm-hmm. they've done with Quincy. Yeah, you and Mike Mitchell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, check out the Doughboys. Uh, and I get up there and something happens that should be a warning to me, which is that a Brotherhood of Steel vertebird comes like lowering down out of the sky toward Quincy. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And I'm just like walking, you know, going along. Uh, the little ghoul boy and Nick Valentine are behind me. Uh, and I keep, you know, glancing over at the vertebird. They're obviously they're like fighting with someone. And this is like a common sight now. I see vertebirds out and about and they end up fighting with raiders or super mutants. Uh, most of the time I can just ignore it. And I'm watching and uh, the vertebird like catches on fire and starts spiraling. And I'm like, huh, wow, that's that's new. Because most of the time the Brotherhood of Steel wins. Most of the time the Brotherhood is like the vertebird like obliterates whatever's on the ground and takes off. Uh, but this one crashes and I'm like, that's interesting. I don't know if I've seen that happen before. Oh, well. And then I open up the doors of Quincy because it's like a big gate and I step in. Uh, and this is like the uh, to bring it all back to memes. Right. Uh, this is like the Garfield meme where he like sees his own face, like with the the no sign through it and says, I wonder who that's for. That's what that uh-huh. vertebrate was for me. <laughs> Because it turns out Quincy is filled with gunners who are like this weird. I don't know if they're like a raider faction or uh, like they've got like all the hallmarks of like a like a basically a PMC. Uh, That's kind of what they look like because they're like all soldiers and stuff. But there's just like gunners just stuffed to the gills in here. And some of these guys, they got names and skulls by their names and power armor. Just like some dudes who have. Yeah. Power, yeah. Yeah, we, we'll have to talk about that in the future. I don't know if we have time in this one, but we, we do need to talk about the fact that there's like legendary creatures and people running around. Yeah. That you have to defeat. Yeah. And they're just like Quincy's just full of them. And uh, I get murdered ceaselessly all the time forever. And I'm like, oh, my God. Uh I have Perhaps this little the most heinous crime the gunners perpetrated was the Quincy massacre when they attacked the southern settlement in force and settlers desperate defense could not withstand the gunners onslaught. <laughs> the t- the ruined town fell and with it the Commonwealth Minutemen. So like that's the, the background there. Yeah, no, this is something that Preston Garvey told us about way back at the beginning of the game. Like that was the thing that they had just escaped when they got to Concord. Uh, was the Quincy massacre. And it turns out the people who did the massacre are still there. Uh I'm I'm a little panicked because I like I have this little ghoul boy following me. He wants to go home. And I think because I've misread the map that his house is in Quincy. And I'm like, his parents are so dead. They are so damn dead. Like, what is the point here? Uh, and then I look closely at the map after I get uh, uh, obliterated a few times. And I realize his house is actually on the other side of Quincy. So I don't have to go through it. I just can like go around it. And once you know it, he just has a house sitting out there uh, and I walk through the front door and there's a ghoul mom and dad standing there. And they're like, Billy, you're home. (laughs) And it turns out that when the bombs fell 200 years ago, his parents also got ghoulified and they're like, you know, I guess it must be something in our genes. And then the little boy is like, that's why you look so much like me. And then the dad is like, more to the point, it's why you look so much like us. Uh. And so now uh, uh, they're all happy. And then um, something very confusing happens where like the woman, like the the mother is like uh, she like thanks me for returning the sun. And then she sort of like skips for a moment, like the the voice track skips. Um, And then she's like, and you took care of that awful man. And I was like, what? Because by this point, I had forgotten that I shot down that slaver on the road. Mm -hmm. And I went and checked the wiki because I was like, what just happened? Uh. And it turns out that if you don't kill him there, he shows up at this point and like tries to take the kid by force. Oh, yeah. Uh, So I don't know. Uh, That didn't happen. And I completed that quest and that's cool. And so I go back to University Point um, and get very confused because what I'm all I have to do to complete the railroad quest is like kill a bunch of synths that are here. Uh, But in doing that, I get like pulled into a building that has like just a whole story like there used to be a a, like a a settlement here uh and there was this girl who was like a little like teen power hacker uh her name was Jacqueline uh and she found some sort of like old pre-war data on a, a computer that she salvaged from the ruins of the university 
Uh, and then she tried to like get it appraised by a merchant who was passing by the settlement. Um, and then he told the Institute because it turned out he was like an Institute informant. So then the Institute came and tried to like uh, they wanted to like bargain for the information. And then like the people in the town didn't like that the Institute was sending representatives. So they like turned against the girl and her father. Uh, and then eventually uh, the Institute just like sent in since and like murdered everyone. And uh, that was the end of that. Like, uh, uh, that's where this settlement went. Uh, and that Jesus. turns out I was confused because of like, I'd been sent here for this radiant quest. Uh, and it turns out that that's just kind of there. Like that's a, like a piece of set dressing that, uh, doesn't really have anything to do with the railroad. Cause that's what I was expecting the entire time. I was like, is this going to like tie into the railroad somehow? But no, this was just a settlement. Um, and then like the sense, I guess that I ran into are the sense that came in like, killed everyone here i suppose um but uh yeah so i finished that and then i go back to the railroad headquarters and uh eventually uh they like you know give me a bunch of experience and then i think it's tinker tom tells me by the way that uh password that uh patriot needs it's in this lab in cambridge uh go go get it so at some point i'm going to go do that and then i guess help with uh, uh escaping some more sense from the institute hmm yep is that all you did? Yep, that was it. I did some radiant quests for uh, our good friend Preston Garvey. Mm -hmm. you know, I murdered his uh, pretender <laughs> and uh, a little while back. I went and did some quests uh, with him, you know, mostly radiant stuff, uh, until he said, we got to get the radio back up. Uh-oh. And I was like, what are you talking The radio? What are you talking I was like, couldn't you? And immediately I go, well, I just built a teleporter. I think I could build a radio <laughs> station. I'll just slap that bad boy up anywhere. And he says, no, we have to go to the castle. Uh. <laughs> is it the gothic castle? <laughs> uh, the, uh, but anyway, so yeah, he says there's a place called the castle. It's like, I don't know, Fort fuck shit. It's uh -huh. some like real location, you know? <laughs> yeah. From the Revolutionary War or some shit. I don't know. Um, it's in Boston. Yeah. Some nerd probably knows exactly all about it. Mm -hmm. But Anyway, so he's like, he asked me what I want to do, and he says, all right, we're going to get a crew together, and I'll see you there. And I said, all right, let's go do it. You know, because I've done a couple other things, too, you know. So I'm going, and I'm uh, going to some cool places. There's a place that's on the southeast of the map that's kind of like, you know, dunes and dunes and islands on a little peninsula where people are living in a settlement. Mm -hmm. and they had me go clear another place out to turn it into a settlement. I had to go fight a bunch of bugs and stuff. Uh, rad scorpions in this game can go under the ground and then pop out and attack your feet. Uh -huh. Has this happened to you yet? Yep. Yeah, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. I hate that. Uh, I like to see creatures coming at me. Yeah, no, they they decided they were going to get their burrowings worth in this game. They're like, yeah, okay, mole rats and rad scorpions. Right. And uh, anyway, so I go to the castle and I meet up Preston Garvey. He's got like, he's like, <laughs> he says something like, I'm going to get a bunch of troops and we'll meet you there. And I get there and it's three people. <laughs> <laughs> It's Preston Garvey and two or and three other people hanging out. So it's like five in total. And it's pretty cool. He asks because the, you know, we're outside the, what he's calling the castle. And it basically was like the stronghold of the Minutemen. And then uh, it was attacked and it broke, you know, the stronghold. And then everything after that was kind of downhill is what he says. Mm -hmm. So I say, all right, let's, let's, I'll learn about that. And he asks, uh, he says, it's full of Meyer lurks. What do you, you know, how do you want to do this? And we can do a pincer move. We can just attack it. I think there's another option that I'm forgetting. And then they can, like, build a firing line. And I can, like, go in and draw them out. And so knowing the way that AI works in Bethesda games, I said, I'll draw them out to you. You just, you <laughs> sit tight, Preston Garvey and crew. And uh, immediately my faith in any of this happening the way it was supposed to was shattered by the fact that one person got stuck on the door on the way out <laughs> and they just walked into the door. They opened the door and the door was in their way and they just walked there and then they kind of got out from under it and I and, and they were really lagging behind. And I was like, maybe I can get them to walk or something, you know, run rather than walk. And so I talked to them and they just stood still. And I thought, oh, no, this is terrible. I've, like, broken this in some way. But they did eventually get there. They build a firing line, or they they stand in a firing line. They got some different weapons. You know, Preston Garvey's got his laser rifle, and everyone's got their own thing. Tonk is a melee character. Mm -hmm. Please remember that. Yes. 
I go up in there and there's a bunch of Meyer Lurks and I grab them and I start dragging them out and they're shooting them. It's working. I've got my Super Sledge that I got, I think, a couple episodes ago. Smashing around with it. It's working pretty good, even though it is, you do have to hit Meyer Lurks in the face. And so Vats is kind of useless because there's no way to target the face. Mm-hmm. It is truly a oversight in combat design in Fallout 4. We do that. I'm dragging them out, blah, 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 blah. They slowly but surely move into the castle, and then he says, hey, we got all the Meyer Lurks, but there's a bunch of eggs. Let's get the eggs. So you got to start wandering around and getting the eggs. So I get, I destroy one nest of eggs. I destroy two nests of eggs. I'm destroying a third nest of eggs, and we hear this, like, fucking, you know, the alien queen. Oh, great. Ah! Mm-hmm. I wander over to the uh, shoreline. Actually, that doesn't happen the first time. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I've got like a sword in my hand or something. Or no, actually, I think I equipped a, an Institute pistol just to more efficiently smash eggs. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, I'm like not paying attention. I, I think I even might have the sound all the way down. <laughs> and I'm just going from thing to thing, do, 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 you know, just like smashing all these eggs and like little critters are following me and whatnot, but I'm just smashing eggs. And then I just turn around and there is a, I don't know, 40 foot tall monster killing everyone. Uh oh. Uh, and it's, it's murdered everyone except for Preston Garvey, who keeps getting, like, knocked down. And I thought, oh, that's a problem. So I went and started attacking it, and it killed me. Is it a right, death so claw? Gotta, it's not a death claw. Oh. I didn't really know what it was this first time. Second run. The thing I said before happens, I hear the sound. No sound beforehand, by the way, mm-hmm. previously. No, I, and I might have had the sound all the way down. I go there, and there's a thing called the Mirelark Queen that comes out of the ocean. Oh, and it's big, and it kind of looks like a Meyer Lurk, I guess. I don't, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't, I don't make Fallout. I don't get to determine what a Meyer Lurk looks like. But they don't look like the dark crystal creatures, right? It looks like kind of like a big lobster almost. Mm-hmm. And it's big. It's like forty feet tall. It's it's nearly as tall as like the walls of the castle. Oh wow! And it could be really cool conceptually, but it isn't because it has two attacks. One, it shoots rust colored gas at you Hmm. and if it hits you it just eats your fucking health like it just just sucks it all the way down and it also spreads on the ground so if you run into it it sucks your health down so it's just terrible right it's pretty accurate too so it hits you so it is i i'm i want to go on record this is one of the worst design things in a fallout (laughs) game just period It's, it's like that attack alone is bad okay here's the other thing it basically one hit one hit kills me uh huh And this is really where I was like, all right, either I did this too early or you're supposed to do this with power armor on. Mm -hmm. And I just refuse to wear power armor. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I die a bunch of times doing this. Uh, You you know, she kills everybody many times. I probably took me five times to do it. She takes the same path and and Preston Garvey in a conversation earlier implied like something came out of the ocean, you know, to destroy the castle. Yeah. So obviously this is a creature that, you know, has been around. She takes the same path every time, which is pretty cool. And, you know, implying and there's a big hole in the wall implying this is the same path she takes every time. Right. Which is neat. Mm -hmm. And so I threw a bunch of mines down there and I thought, oh, this is going to really make an impact. But actually, every time I did it, it just killed everyone else who was standing there and (laughs) blew them up with mines. It didn't really work all that, that way I wanted it to. The uh, But uh, what's notable about the fight, and really the way I ended up doing it, is just I equipped the Institute pistol. I had like 600 rounds for it, and I just like needled this thing to death <laughs> over a long amount of time because uh, Nick Valentine couldn't be downed eternally. You know, he gets downed and then comes back eventually. Yeah. Preston Garvey also similarly couldn't do that. And then one of the guys who was in the crew also was like unpermadeathable. You know, he would he would go down and then get back up, go down and get back up. Somewhere in the middle here, Preston Garvey also picks up in every fight. He picked up a flamer. And so it's just Preston Garvey just shooting a flamethrower directly into the sky, catching this thing on fire. And actually took, you know, did a lot of health. Presumably, maybe I was supposed to pick that up and use it to better effect, but it, it all worked out. Anyway, so we, we kill the thing. Lo and behold, the guy who could not die, oh, no. he's the radio operator. <laughs> <laughs> he sits in the chair to get and there's a big radio tower in the middle of this courtyard kind of area. And uh, you got to power it and do all kinds of shit like that. But I got it going. And what's neat about it, although it's kind of annoying, is that if you're it creates a radio station, I think it's called Freedom Radio. Mm-hmm. Nothing loaded about that. Uh-huh. And when you listen to it, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it gives you new little missions, mm-hmm. you know, lo- mm-hmm. little radiant quests. But yeah, local businesses also- to inspect and things of that nature. Exactly. You know, you gotta go. You gotta get that A. Uh huh. You know, that A rating. But uh, the other thing that's pretty cool about it is that, uh, like other radio stations, you can hear it when you're proximal to it, and you can get quests from that too, just by standing around. Oh. Um, but this place is like the castle's like wired for electricity all throughout it. It has a bunch of discrete rooms that are their own thing. So this is like a straight up Skyrim castle. Oh yeah, you know, for, oh, for like mm-hmm. s- cool Skyrim dudes to play in. And um, I refuse. I I, I don't want to be there. But uh, so I unlocked that. I did that, and that actually took so long that I didn't really do anything else. No. Oh. I mean that. Then puts us at about where we wanted to be for this episode, I think. Next time, are we going to do more side quests or? I don't know. What, it, you got anything? Uh, you know what? Probably in next episode, we should probably do some Brotherhood. Yeah, we should. Let's, let's get our last faction and let's pursue that a little bit. And I will look to see like what the point of no return is for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's check out what the Brotherhood is up to because we really don't know. I've seen the uh, that was actually a thing that I forgot to mention about being down around um, Quincy. Uh, is that you can see the airship over at the airport. Like, you can see it across the water. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, you can just look up and it's up there. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's like a neat thing. The other thing that's pretty notable that I ran into, did you run into the Raider racetrack? No. Where they race robots? No, no, not at all. all right. Well, we'll figure out what the quest is that, that goes with that. And we'll do it. OK, at some point. <laughs> because it's they race like Mr. Handy's around in a big circle. OK, it sounds very fun. Cool, but yeah, so in the next episode, we're going to do some Brotherhood of Steel quests, and we'll probably just do all of them that we can until there's a point of no return. Okay. Um, I think at this point, because we have all the factions unlocked, we can just kind of push them all to their final, you know, decision point. Mm -hmm. So we'll do that, and then we'll finish up uh, the ones that we're doing. I think we probably won't do very many Institute quests, unfortunately. Fine by me. uh, My disappointing son. really want to. Yeah, yeah. Uh... (laughs) You could always explode them again. You <laughs> thought about that? I could. I wonder, hmm, at what point can I explode my son most efficiently? Like, after I've, like, is there a point? I need to figure that out. What's the sweet spot for me? Not failing the railroad's quest line, but uh, keeping my son exploded. Powerful. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we will be back in two weeks uh, with another episode. If you like this and you want to listen to it uh, as a podcast, and you're not currently doing that. You can go to patreon.com slash range touch. And if you give us three dollars a month or your local equivalent to that, you can get access to an RSS feed. You can just load that up and you can listen to it if you don't want to check out the video part. But if you're not seeing the video part, you're missing a lot of great uh, tonk turning around content. Um, <laughs> uh and uh but yeah we'll be back in two weeks um uh with another episode with brotherhood of steel talk we'll find out if they are truly dominating the wasteland yep and we'll see that war never changes but maybe the brotherhood of steel has